in the Camillas and I made Hollywood. In 1915, he made uh, eight films just in that one year. Most of them are masterpieces, as far as we can tell, the ones that have survived. This is one of the films that he made in 1915, The Warrens of Virginia. You may never have heard of it, let alone seen it, because another film was made called Birth of a Nation. And Birth of a Nation became the popular um, Civil War drama. The Warrens of Virginia would have been the rival to it, if Birth of the Nation hadn't appeared. Um, in fact, it was written, the play was written by DeMille Cecil's brother, William DeMille, and it was presented by Velasco, so you can see um, how it goes. So that's an image from the film, The Warrens of Virginia, which shows uh, DeMille using this high contrast, um, new lighting style in, in this film. And this was widely discussed. The distributors of the film came to him and said, uh, Mr. DeMille, we're not very sure about this, it's very dark. What are people going to say? According to the legend, DeMille said, let's call it Rembrandt Lighting. <laughs> and the idea stuck. Uh, as far as we know, he made it up on the spot, trying to explain that this was artistic lighting. He reached for Rembrandt, why not? Could have been like this, but Rembrandt was obviously better known. And this became known as Rembrandt Lighting. Went under various uh, this is perhaps the single most important of these 1915 films that Janelle made. Uh, it's called The Cheat. Uh, you can easily find it online if you don't know it. It's an extraordinary film. It's a melodrama set on Long Island um, amongst the, the uh, wealthy of Long Island. And it, it concerns a woman who uh, borrows money from her neighbor, who is an ivory dealer. And when she fails to pay back the money, he brands her. <laughs> um, it's very lurid. It's got incredible use of lighting. Lighting through the paper walls, through the screens. It's intense, chiaroscuro lighting. Uh, perhaps the most extreme that the Camille had yet done. And when this film was released in France, uh, two years later, it became the film that ignited the French avant-garde. Everybody who took the film in France in the 1920s had seen Prophet to Europe, as known in France, cheat to us. It was an extremely influential film. With it came the emphasis on a lighting style. Now, I'm going to whisk you through some examples of this as a history of the film. It isn't time to talk about it in great detail, but what we should remember is that progressive cinema cinema that wanted to draw attention to itself, artistic cinema, um, has always relied upon pronounced lighting effects. Lighting is one of the, the signature devices that filmmakers used to show that what they were doing was not merely canned theatre, not merely mass entertainment. But here are just some examples from the German cinema of the 1920s, uh, which were extremely influential in a different way. The cabinet of Dr. Caligari made just on the eve of the 20s became the most famous, the most notorious of the German films made after World War I. And it's not, strictly speaking, a chiaroscuro film. It's a film which uses intense contrast between black and white, but it also uses painted shadows. It's, a, um, it, it's very, very dramatic in its use of this black-white contrast. And many of the shadows we see in the German studios haven't yet got this lighting are simply painted on the set. People were for it or against it. Have you seen Gallagher? What do you think of it? This was the debate going on amongst people who were getting into it in films and art in the 1920s. Virginia Woolf, for instance, um, did see it at the Film Society in London. She was not very impressed. She said a piece of dirt in the projector was more interesting than the film. That was Virginia Woolf. She wasn't any good in fact. But um, this is from Shadows by Arthur Robson, which is an incredible film made in the early 20s using shadow play. It's, it's a phantasmagoric story within a story which uses these deep, dark shadows uh, which become, which interact with the characters and become, lead us into a kind of different reality. And then the film, which again is not as well known today as it was then, Monal's great film Faust which is an incredibly painterly 
eloquent film, um, which was so successful and so popular in the mid-1920s that it took more out to America. He was invited by an American studio, and uh, it's one of the first of the Germans to be invited to Hollywood on the strength of his disposed. Um, Monard had been an art historian, he'd been trained in art history, and he brought to all his filmmaking uh, a very well-trained eye. He's often trying to recreate particular paintings, particular painting effects. So for him, certainly, um, the art historical references were important and of course the subject like, like Faust, he had a lot to draw. And this story continues. Uh, I'm not going to take us through all the different stages of it, but let's just say that in the 1940s, there's a the return of Gerard Sciuro um, in some of the very important films of the period. This is in Citizen Kane. Citizen Kane has a, a fantastic range of lighting effects um, and effects of distortion, of course, by putting things very close to the camera and other things very far away. So we, we're getting a lot of spatial elasticity and distortion in this game, as well as an intense girl's hero often figures that are just completely blacked out with shards of light picking out details. Of course, that's a film which was not influential in 1941, but would become the world's most admired film in the post-war world. That's Die Zira, a film by, by uh, Carl Dreyer, made during the war, which again is very influenced by the visual style of the period that the film is setting. So a self-consciously um, antique film, as you can see from that still. And this is from Harlan Pressburger's uh, rediscovered film, Canterbury Tale, which again has some extraordinary Gerald's Bureau effects. The, the reference in that slide I showed earlier, which may have meant something to some people, but perhaps not to everybody, to John Alton. Who was John Alton? Well, he is somebody revered by cinematographers. He was a very prolific cinematographer who worked largely on genre films. He didn't make um, high concept films for the most part. Much of his work during the 1940s was um, in really low budget films with titles like The Amazing Mr. X. And, uh, you can see some of the titles down there. Uh, he walked by night. He's admired to this day, revered by cinematographers because of his use of extreme chiaroscuro. Um, so Alton would be an important reference point if we're looking at um, the use of um, ultra chiaroscuro in lighting. And interestingly, he did it in poverty row films, not in high concept films. And so the phrase film noir which really comes out of the 1940s, the French phrase that was used to describe the typical American films of the 1940s. It's really a reference in part to the enormous amount of darkness that these films used on screen. It also refers to their themes, but it refers to their visual style. And we could, of course, trace another return in more modern times, in, in Pasolini. Um, Pasolini, of course, was not a part of the original neo-realist movement in, in the 1940s. I was too young for that. But when he entered cinema in the 1950s, he forged a new style, which is very much a style of getting down amongst the ordinary people. And perhaps the prime example of that, uh, his, his street film style, is Mama Roma, great film he made for Hanagnani in 1962. And if you just I was just looking at which frames I could pick out and if you know the film. That's a, a more caravagistic style in two senses. First of all, he's using pools of light to pick out, especially Magnani's face. He's using a lot of darkness, but he's also creating a sense of the people, the ordinary people. This is a film a bit out of Pasolini's love of admiration for the <laughs> The liveliness of street life in Rome. He comes from Friuli to Rome. He plunged into the world of the Roman uh, streets, the petty criminals. And that's what he's trying to put on the screen in films like Mama Roma. And that, of course, is taking us back to something of the subject matter material that Caravaggio 
two further. And perhaps the, the, the last one of these in the top of the convention is Vittorio Storato. <laughs> um, Storato has shot, of course, some of the most interesting, most important films of modern times. Godfather, um, Apocalypse Now, uh, there's Reds, very interesting film, David Warren Bates, and the performance of the religion of And what's interesting about Storato is that he has taken Caravaggio on board and, and identifies with him to really quite extraordinary extent. This is his website. As you say, say rather modestly, Storaro Caravaggio. <laughs> Never wants to be. And he's published um, a series of volumes which he explores, painting of light, as he calls it, and very much identifies with um, the influence, the example of Caravaggio. You can see on another his website it says uh, La Filosofia. Well, the philosophia that he's advocating is a return to Caravaggio's um, principles of life. He also shoots Woody Allen's films, by the way. Mm -hmm. He's one of the elaborate films. He's actually DP a film on Caravaggio. Sorry? He's DP a film on Caravaggio as well. Yes, indeed, absolutely. I was going to say, he's, 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 um, he's carried and put into practice and his Caravaggioism, and as you, you would say, yeah, well, that's yeah, what the text there does say something about it. Um, but he has, uh, he's made a film about Caravaggio, you yeah. Now, I'm going to really structure the rest of what I'm going to say in part by referring back to this as another key uh, modern exhibition. Um, Latin, I believe, the Los Angeles National Museum of Art uh, staged um, an important exhibition in 2013 called Bodies and Shadows, Caravaggio and His Legacy. It's the equivalent, in a way, of the National Gallery exhibition that I was talking about earlier. Beyond Caravaggio. So it's really trying to use um, the fact that Caravaggio initiated a flood of imitators um, and those influenced by his, his style. Uh, and and Keith was telling me earlier today that in fact there are traces of sort of uh, uh, vernacular Caravaggio to be found uh, in Malta and, and elsewhere. Um, that we don't even, there are layers of Caravaggio influence which uh, many in the outside world wouldn't know about at all. But the important thing about this exhibition, it was, I think, very important, being held in Los Angeles, capital of world cinema, was that it had a very interesting and eclectic series of screenings. And many people looked at the films that were being shown in, alongside the exhibition and thought, this is an interesting subject area. This is perhaps the first time that the influence of Caravaggio on cinema was looked at more, more analytically uh, by a major museum. So what did they show? Well, there you can see a list of some of the films. And I'm just going to explore some of those in the time that we have and show you a few short extracts from what you can find I don't mind that. Um, Pedro Costa, a very striking uh, Portuguese filmmaker who makes uh, extraordinarily intense uh, films, is perhaps most, um, the, the least, least known of, of the international directors on the list. And if there was time, I would show you some of this film, for Sangue, which um, is a black and white film, but a film of striking chiaroscuro. Strongly recommended if you don't know the film. There isn't time to do that. Even less well known is uh, an Italian film, Contratorio, uh, by Ben Benuti, 1992 film. And I have to say that I only discovered this film through the Los Angeles retrospective. I thought that's a film I don't know. Uh, I should look into it to find out. It's, uh, ben Benuti is a not very well known filmmaker who, in fact, came from an art history. And so it's perhaps not totally surprising that he. Um, so this film, which is based on the, the real case of two Jewish youths who were interrogated in Rome and were the attempt was made to convert them to Christianity before they were executed. And so the film is set in a very low-key um, period, 
situation. Let me show you a little bit of it to give you a sense of uh, how Thank <laughs> you. 